Um, I'd like to welcome you all um, very warmly to this uh, seminar as part of the Educational Research Seminar Series. I'm Jan MacArthur and I'll be chairing the session. Um, I meant to have some notes to all the important things I have to tell you, but I've lost it. So my colleague Dee is going to help me out if I miss anything. But this is just to say that uh, this is being recorded and a recording will be available afterwards. Um, Dee, did I have to say anything else really important at the start? Uh, just that it's been live streamed for postgraduate students, staff and other interested people who can ask questions at the end of the presentation using their audio or via the chat box. And if everyone can just switch off the camera and mute their microphone during the presentation, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Dee, <laughs> my, my co-chair. Uh, and, and as you see, the chat's already lively, so we, we welcome contributions to the chat as we go. And Vicky's going to talk for about 45 minutes, then we'll have time for um, time for, for questions and, and a good chat. So I just want to introduce Vicky, introduce Vicky Hill to you. She's an educational developer at the University of Arts in London. She has over 20 years of experience in art and design education, uh, leading to her being a senior fellow of the HEA. She's the co-lead on the QAA Academic Enhancement Model Strand on Fostering Belonging and Compassionate Pedagogy. So she's been working in this field for some time and is now co-lead of this important project. And she's also a doctoral student here with us in the Department of Educational Research on our doctoral program in um, educational research, higher education. Um, I just want to say something personally about, uh, about Vicky. She's the sort of educational researcher that I admire so much that what she's researching isn't just a topic, it's something she believes in, is committed to. Uh, she is one of the most genuine, kind and compassionate and collegial people I've been lucky enough to meet. Um, and I really admire her work and the way she goes about her work. So uh, with that introduction, I'll pass over to Vicky. Thank you all for coming. Oh, thanks so much, Jan. That's, um, that's lovely. <laughs> um, really, yeah, really kind of you to say those things. Um, I'm just going to share, share my screen and um, get started on this. One second. Let me try that again. Okay, I'm hoping you can all see this okay. Um, and I'm going to just move this down here too. Okay. Brilliant. Um, I was hoping that I could um, I could have a look at the chat today, but um, I think I might I might not be able to do that on my computer. So if, if um if Jan, if you're able to um to just let me know if anything's coming in, that would be super. Um, so yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for the invitation, um, Jan and Kimmy and uh, and Dee obviously for for sorting this out, Rebecca for the backup. Um, it's really lovely to to be here and um. I'm going to be talking um, predominantly around the QAA collaborative enhancement projects that, that I'm leading called Blowing Through Assessment Pipelines for Compassion. Um, but as you'll see, it's kind of overlaps with um, the work that I'm doing um, as an educational developer. Um, and I, I work at University of the Arts London. So University of the Arts London, UAL, is um, it, it's, uh, one of the largest arts unions in the world. And it's um, it's combined with six colleges, which you may have heard of. You've got Central St. Martins, London College of Fashion, London College of Communication, Camberwell, Wimbledon, Chelsea. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big old place with lots of um, quite diverse um, uh, uh, students and, um, and subjects as well across all screen, film, fine arts, performance, fashion, psychology, business, lots of different things. Um, and I'm also studying my doctoral uh, studies here, as, as Jan has said, I'm in cohort 25 of the, um, the Adres Higher Education Programme. So that's year three. Um, and um, so it's just, uh, yeah, really great to be able to talk about, about my work and the work I'm doing on the PhD as well will be the sort of coming into this as well. Um, it was quite hard to separate some of this. So hopefully it will, um, it will kind of make sense as I take you through a bit of a story. Um, I just wanted to sort of start really with um, with this kind of question of how we're feeling today, because we're going to be talking about 
compassion and we're going to be talking about belonging and um, I just wanted to sort of recognize that you know we're bringing ourselves to this space um, and um, I just wanted you know feel free to use the chat um, which I can't actually see but um, if you wanted to pop that in today how are you doing how are you doing today how are you feeling why are you coming to this space um, some of us might have just grabbed a few minutes and others might be um, be able to be a bit more luxurious with our time I'm feeling quite inquisitive and um, I'm looking forward to, to hearing some of your thoughts about um, about this work and um, I'm probably a bit like this bunny feeling a little bit nervous too um, just listening to what's going on. So this session today um, I'm going to talk about um, belonging and I'm going to talk about compassionate assessment um, which are maybe things that we don't necessarily put together very often um, and I'm going to explain a bit about the collaborative enhancement project um, and there's a couple of strands of research. Um, I'm going to predominantly be talking about kind of pass fail grading and some of the work around that. Um, and then just probably leave you with a bit of a teaser about the work we started around the whole self. Um, and then we've got some time for, for a discussion. Um, and as I was preparing last night, um, as last minute as usual, um, I, I was just looking at um, this, uh, this um, tweet that Amanda Gorman had put out on Twitter a couple of weeks back, which had really made me giggle because she'd said a friend had given her this engraved compass and it took her several moments to remember that you know, she'd actually written this in her book. Uh, I thought, yeah, that sounds familiar, just forgetting all the things that we do because we're so busy. Um, but it was a really lovely engraving and it says, you know, lost as we feel, there is no better compass than compassion. Um, and I was thinking about this in terms of, of the work that I want to talk about today and how um, more and more so I've been using this idea of, of compass, you know, of compassion as a compass, as a kind of a guiding principle um, and using it to think about um, assessment and teaching practice and, and policies. So I'm just kind of holding on to my, my compass to, today um, with you. So I thought I'd give you a wee bit of background um, into sort of belonging and higher education and, and my work and where this is kind of coming from. So um, as Jan mentioned, I, I co-lead a strand of academic development work um, with my colleague Liz Bunting, um, whose name will pop up in this a few times, I think. Um, and this is called Fostering Belonging and Compassionate Pedagogy. Um, and there's three strands of work at UAL um, that, 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 that we're, we kind of interlap with. And one is that assessment for equity and the other is decolonizing pedagogy and curriculum. Um, so we, 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 we cross over and we interrelate. But with the, our strand, we're really looking at how um, we work with course teams and we're looking at how belonging relates to learning, to teaching and to students' experiences. Um, and we're thinking about how it can be fostered through teaching practice. Um, and we kind of use compassionate pedagogy as, as kind of the praxis. It's kind of the approach to foster belonging. Um, as you may know, the sense of belonging became a really prominent topic in the UK higher education sector after the publication of Liz Thomas's um, heftily funded um, 2020-12 report, uh, What Works About Student Retention and Success. And it really highlighted that these feelings of isolation and not fitting in were the most common reasons that students in the UK considered withdrawing from university. So this idea of creating a culture of belonging sort of became a real a priority for, for building student attainment, retention, engagement, and, and it's considered one of the most kind of important needs of students in their learning. Um, and also student belonging is increasingly used to, to understand and award ethnic, um, to understand the awarding differentials or ethnicity awarding differentials, um, which exist between uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic home students and home white students. Um, and I recognize that the, that term is, is problematic and it tends to um, homogenize groups of students. So when we're using this or looking at data, um, you know, I always talk about disaggregation and looking at the experiences of, of, of students to disaggregate that data and understand different experiences as much as possible. Um, so while a sense of belonging is, is needed by all our students, it's experienced unequally. Um, and the research and sector research has found that a sense of, of belonging is really a big concern for uh, racially minoritized and melanated students um, because they're experiencing overt and subtle um, exclusion and, and racism and inequities. Um, I draw quite a lot on, on uh, Anna Mountford Zimder's report um, in 2015, which was looking at the causes of differences in student outcomes um, because this isn't a, um, a student deficit issue. Um, you know, it's been identified that it's not to do with the individual student, it's to do with the, the structures and the conditions and institutional structural racism or teaching practices um, and inequalities in, in, in our, our kind of education system. So the shift of the terminology was from, it used to be the attainment gap, um, but we call it the awarding gap to make sure that that responsibility sits 
squarely with the, the institution. Um, and Mountford Zindler has talked about how um, the relationships between staff and students alongside this kind of psychosocial identity factors are really kind of key in, in this experience. Um, in our um, Fostering Belonging Compassionate Pedagogy strand, we draw, we draw quite a lot on Terrell uh, Strayhorn and Carol Goodenow as well to, to think about kind of the definition of the phenomenon of belonging. And there are many definitions, um, but this idea of kind of students feeling um, that, they, um, that they're valued, respected, supported, and that they matter by teachers and by peers in order to feel part of the university learning community. Um, and I've also popped up this um, as a, a link to the podcasts that, that we've been developing, which has been a really great learning process for me because it's been bringing together voices from students and staff um, kind of internationally about talking around belonging and, and compassion and the work we're doing today. Um, so sense of belonging is, um, is a really powerful effective state that's sort of driving human beha behaviour. Um, and if we're talking about um, belonging uh, as being a way of enabling our students to be fully human, like John A. Powell talks about this a lot, um, and to make sure that they're seen and that they're respected for who they are, um, that we want, really want them to be able to kind of uh, be valued for bringing their whole selves to their learning. And this idea of the whole self I'll come back to a bit later. Um, Bell Hooks. Uh, discusses this as you know teaching in a way that cares for the souls of our students um, and to me this you know kind of compassionate approach to pedagogy is really focused on the, the human connection um, what Paolo Freire I guess we call the pedagogy of love and that's kind of the cornerstone I think of this and um, so I'm really interested in compassion and how we think about it um, and in recent years there's been you know there's been quite a a lot of research or growth and research that speaks to the compassionate turn in education and clearly with you know the, the kind of response of higher education institutions to to the pandemic there's been a real focus on the well-being of, of, of students and of staff and a real recognition that this is you know this is uh, staff also need support here too um so compassion is really complex it's multifaceted um it's got its roots in diverse and ancient philosophical contemporary perspectives um, and it's presented as kind of a relational process and, and also as a motive um, that attends to kind of emotional and physical responses to suffering and Berlant and Gibbs and Nausbaum all, all speak, speak a lot about this. Um, so across all these dis different disciplines, there is an agreement that it means noticing and reducing distress. Um, and I'm looking at Theo Gilbert, if you, if you haven't come across Theo Gilbert's work, I'd really recommend Theo, um, who does a lot of work around kind of assessment and compassionate assessment as well. So um, Theo has really kind of shaped my thinking around this. Um, and Theo talks about compassion being the noticing of social or physical distress to others and a commitment to reduce or prevent that distress. Um, and Kristen Neff also talks about self-compassion as something which I'm thinking more of um, as an educational developer, working with staff and seeing um, kind of some assessment practices with staff as well and, and the need for our own kind of sense of self-compassion and self-kindness. Um, and she talks about, you know, having a sense of co common humanity and mindfulness. Um, but compassion is often conflated um, with related concepts such as pity or empathy or kindness. Um, but what I really love about it is it's the action that sets it apart. So it's actually the motivation to act, to alleviate suffering. So for me, compassion is this kind of, it's an activism, it's a call uh, for social justice. And that's really my kind of um, positioning of it and my interest in it. Um, there, there's, there's, there's really good uh, and important critiques around compassion as well. Um, and I've taken this, uh, Catherine Waddington writes a lot about compassionate organizations and policies. Um, and in her book, she's referring quite a lot to Simpson Clegg and Pitts' article about the kind of critique of, um, of, of compassion, that it can be, there could be a focus on it uh, as a kind of psychological state um, rather than this sort of social relational construct. Um, and it can also have a real tendency to ignore power dynamics um, that were inherent in these social situations and relations. Um, and this kind of view that compassion is virtuous um, and it kind of neglects the negative outcomes and the impacts that can, uh, can arise. Um, so I think these, these are really important things to, to hold on to when we're thinking about it and constantly kind of asking those questions of, you know, who benefits from this and what are the power effects and uh, what types of subjects are kind of, you know, are shaped by this too. Okay, so um, 
if people know Jan, then obviously they'll know about Jan's work on social justice and, and, and assessment. Um, and But if you're new to this, you might be saying, what does compassion have to do with assessment? These things are kind of, uh, yeah, they don't come together necessarily very often um, in our conversations, particularly at a kind of quality level. So just as a kind of groundwork on this, really, the, um, the Quality Assurance Agency, the QAA, um, who are funding the project that, um, that I'm going to talk about, um, they, they talk about how, um, you know, assessment criteria and grade descriptions, you know, they're really, they're part of this assurance and they're kind of, their aims to promote really accountability and transparency, objectivity, which is always a scary one um, for me anyway, um, but they talk about the kind of uh, this sort of deliberate systematic quality insurance um, the assessment processes standards you know they're applied consistently equitably reliably with you know validity and fairness um, which all sounds amazing it sounds great but there is clearly a massive gap between policy and what is written um, you know this kind of focus on standards and fairness this procedural aspect of it um, and also what Jan's kind of talked about in her book as well rather than the lived experience, what is the reality of assessment? Um, what happens to individuals, both staff and students going, going through this process? And there, you know, there's bags of research um, you know, that, that talk about the unreliability of, of um, assessment practices. Um, I've just put a couple here, but there's, there's, there's lots more, um, whether it's uh, Wolf talks about the kind of fixed habits and Eckstone's thinking about kind of the lack of engagement criteria. I've done some work around kind of um, you know, we don't need learning outcomes at UAL, um, the kind of complexity of the decisions they're being having to make, the, the blocks and explorers, and then um, the kind of norm referencing as, as well. Um, and Sadler also kind of talks about the kind of transparency or the lack of transparency about these kind of judgments being uh, outside and hidden from students and from their view. So it's a really compelling body of research that's critiquing this kind of the, the, the normative assumptions around validity and fairness in grading practices. And that's kind of really sort of central um, to, to this work. And thinking around what actually happens to, to students with, with grading. Um, I think for me, what, what became, I guess, the kind of catalyst really for me thinking about this and why I kind of began to really want to um, think more deeply around compassion and assessment was um, with the no detriment policy. So in April 2020, uh, the UK was in the first weeks of its lockdown um, over the pandemic um, and higher education providers were introducing no detriment or safety net models to kind of mitigate against all the different challenges that have been caused by COVID. Um, so, you know, this, these were really centred around student well-being and they were acknowledging all these kind of unforeseen circumstances, um, you know, whether it could be illness or financial, domestic problems, uh, caring responsibilities, there was harassment and disruption to studying, travel, uh, lots of the shift to online learning, lots of different things that were, were happening to people. Um, so I carried out this kind of micro level study looking at um, the kind of the staff, academic staff experiences of pass fail assessment, um, looking at this no detriment policy. So, UAL had several, but the one that I was really interested in was the change uh, for all year one undergraduate students from graded assessment, you know, letter grade, to just pass fail for that would be um, you know, level four for so year one undergraduate. Um, and the university stated that it was in order to simplify the assessment process and to ease the pressure during a very stressful time for staff and students in an exceptional external uh, context. Um, and I was really interested in this, so I was kind of applying a principles of compassion as a theoretical lens to, to kind of look at whether the kind of the policy sort of did what it said in the tin. Um, and I couldn't get my head around the kind of the ethics of this being a temporary policy if we recognise that the students and staff are finding assessment processes very complex, if they are incredibly pressured, if they're very stressful, how can we go back again? Um, you know, these the, the, the situations that we're that we're in and we're finding ourselves in, they, they haven't gone and um, and they, they they may not never go for many people. Um, so I really wanted to to explore this further. Um, so I kind of um, I was having these conversations at UAL with my colleagues and um, we got onto Twitter because Twitter is awesome and and started having a look around to just see if anyone else was interested in kind of pass fail and thinking around whether 
they said um, this was something that could be kind of considered compassionate and understanding grading. Um, and I, I got in touch with um, Professor Sam Broadhead, who's head of research at Leeds Arts University. Um, and we started talking about our interest in, in this and we decided to, to bring some folk together and apply for the QA Collaborative Enhancement Project funding. Um, so it's about 10 grand of funding for, um, for kind of a year and a half uh, projects where we're, we're, we're bringing together Glasgow School of Art, Leeds Arts Uni and UAL and we're working on, on this, this kind of project together. Um, Al Matley, who's a deputy director at Glasgow School of Art, um, had worked at CSM so I kind of had a connection there as well um, and we, we kind of pulled in other folk that we're working with that, that we figured would be really interested in, in this. So the project that I'm talking to you about today is about halfway through, so I can kind of tell you what our aims are and some of the work we've done, but we're still working on it. Um, so the project aims were to identify areas of enhancement in assessment policies and practices and to promote a student sense of belonging and tackle issues of social justice. And I wanted to link the relational work with the attainment gap or awarding differentials agenda in the creative arts, specifically for, for me and for UL, we're looking at the ethnicity awarding differentials um, and to develop collaborative, dialogic, polyvocal and effective resources for staff development across the higher education sector. Um, and I'm, I've obviously shared the, the link to the podcasts earlier, but um, particularly because we're in a, a, a maybe in an art and design context um, or a creative arts university, you know, there's a um, there's a space for where people are, are are genuinely interested in engaging with um, academic enhancement work that is um, that's creative, that's effective, that's um, perhaps not going to a workshop, but thinking about different ways that we can we can um, start discussions and, and ask questions um, with each other um, using maybe more embodied and effective practices. Um, so we're, we're looking to create that too. So within the project, um, we, we're really sort of taking Jan's um, um, sort of Jan's kind of thinking around assessment as, as kind of key or something that we wanted to hold on to. Um, and Jan's written, you know, if assessment shapes how and what students learn, as the literature suggests in a book committed to social justice within and through higher education, then surely assessment is a key to the achievement of that social justice. So you know, this is kind of where we're sort of wanting to locate our, our thinking um, uh, through, throughout this project. So at the moment, there's there's three strands of research that that we're kind of um, that we're that we're working on. Um, one is pass fail grading, and I'm going to spend more time talking about that today. Um, the second one is is looking at feedback and thinking around kind of um, sort of compassionate feedback practices, and the third is the the whole self um, and how to. Um, how what pro processes and practices and policies are, are there to encourage us to be able to bring the whole of the student self to to assessment. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the pass fail one because we that's probably the one where we've have done a little bit more um, got a bit more headway I guess we've done a little bit more work on this. Um, so pass fail um, uh, or grading is, is quite a, a large kind of literature base coming from America on this and Susan Blum's book on grading has, um, has kind of been been a bit of a champion of this but it's very different in the US context as it is um, in UK higher education um, so we we haven't really necessarily thought of ungrading so much but been thinking around sort of pass fail as a way of exploring this and that builds on the work that I've done from the no detriment policies so as a bit of a background um, letter grading itself um, was designed in the 19th century and it really was meant to sort students by ranking them you know based on their performance along a continuum who's at the top who's at the bottom um, we all know stories of people being asked to sit in order of you know attainment in the class um, and, and and that was very much kind of where it's where it's from um, but there's been real critiques of this right from when it first started um, and Cohn's written quite extensively about it that Grading um, by giving students grades, a uh, letter or number grades, it can reduce the quality of students' thinking um, and it can diminish the interest in the task because the students are, are, are looking to get chase the grade, I guess. Um, and it can create a preference for, for easy tasks. Um, we've definitely found that kind of um, that idea of grading can reduce 
risk taking because um, you know the, the, the I guess the risk of failure is a bit too high at times. Um, and Blood Good's written as well about how pass fail assessment um, has been shown to reduce stress and improve well being. Um, and there's there's a fair amount of research that kind of backs this up across across the sector. Um, oh, that's a fish fan. Excuse me. Um, so. Um, I'm really interested in, in Jesse Stommel's work as well that's been that is around kind of ungrading but it really helps kind of ask those questions around um, you know how normalized grading is for staff and students um, you know we've been conditioned to work in this system for you know for years all through our educational experience um, that kind of emphasizes the the kind of the idea of objectivity um, the measuring performance ranking quantitative marks um, and how completely ingrained this this can be um, and how difficult change is because it's very uh, I think I've said it in other ways but um, when you're swimming around in the fishbowl it's quite difficult to see the water so how can we maybe conceptualize um, assessment with, without grading or um, to, to think of it as, as something else? So on the, the project blog, um, which again, the, the links, the link will be shared as well. Um, there's a whole series of videos from, from our project because we've, um, we started off at the launch event uh, back in the summer. And then in October, we held a symposium um, for, for a day, we had keynotes by Jan and Mahab Ali, um, and then different uh, partners were speaking and different students spoke as well about their experiences um, of, of assessment. Um, so this is all kind of on, on the website as part of the kind of resources to, to share. But I thought I would just try and play um, a little clip, so you don't have to listen to my voice anymore, um, from one of the discussions around pass fail assessment. So I'm just going to try and share this. Um, seamlessly, hopefully. While you're doing that, Vicky, I'll just tell you that in the chat, there's a lot about how this space is exciting, encouraging, you know, nourishing. So that's how people are feeling. Fantastic. That's really great to hear. Oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong button. I was about to say I'm doing this, doing this so well, but um, let's see. Chrome, there we go. Okay. No, I hope you can hear this okay. Um, so just as a kind of backup, this is um Dr. Kate Mori was was uh, facilitating the conversation with uh, Peter Hughes is at the top right hand side, he's from Leeds, and Professor Sam, Broad, Sam Broadhead's at the bottom left, and then uh, Dr. Neil Currents. So and Neil, Neil and I are, are working on the paper that I'm going to talk to you about in a minute as well. Um, so I'm just we'll listen to this for maybe a minute. That, that we saw, and of course, it is contextualized within a particular level and a particular subject. Yeah, I mean, to, to add to that, I mean, our past fair research was first year, so it's undergraduate, so, so different contexts, and I would, a lot of those are very similar to, to what we found. I would also say, I think one of the big things that we saw was that students felt there was a reduction in stress and anxiety. You know, students really talk about grades causing a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety and so that pass fail particularly during the pandemic was a real really helped them calm down and, and come into university transition into university and feel they could get their feet if you like under the table and not have to worry about performing as sam as you're saying that's kind of performing and chasing grades kind of thing kind of went out the window um, obviously it helped with specialist equipment you know obviously students often produce really you know need specialist equipment in the studio and so on and that kind of in the pandemic situation that wasn't possible so it again reduced the anxiety not having to produce all these these this kind of focus on the product but, but focus on the process of learning and being creative um and i think definitely that allowed some students to be more creative and, and focus on learning and not chasing grades, as, as Sam has said. And I think intriguingly, we've got some data that suggests that our progression rates for Black and Asian students have increased relative 
to their white peers. So the gap of progression has actually decreased during the period when we had pass fail. Now, you know, it's an unusual period. It's kind of one set, one limited set of data, but it's certainly really intriguing to think about, you know, awarding gaps and, and wonder whether, you know, as Jan said, the more differentiations of grades you have, does that actually somehow create or contribute to awarding gaps for, for some students? If I could carry on maybe then with um, just sort of a recapping of it, the, the synthesis of, of the ideas that, that I was... I'm just going to... Stop sharing there. And share from here. Okay. Is that working, Jan? Can you see the PowerPoint? Okay. Yep, it's fine. Okay, brilliant. Um, I, 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 I love listening to this conversation, um, but uh, as I said, it's a, one of the podcasts as well on interrogating spaces. So if you prefer to listen to it audioly, then um, you can jump on there as, as well and listen listen there. There's chapter markers that make it a little bit easier to, um, to see what's happening. Um, so as, as Neil said, um, we, we, we wrote, um, we're in the midst of writing actually, we haven't, we haven't finished it. We're in writing up um, a piece of research that we did. We wrote a report and, and we've already submitted that at URL for um, you know, to the kind of quality panel. And we're um, we're working on, on this, this kind of second article for, for publication. Um, and we're looking at the kind of the purpose of this graded accept assessment, you know, what is the purpose of it in an anxious world? Um, so it's Liz Bunting, Neil, myself, and uh, Dr. Emily Celine, who are um, all at UAL uh, working together on this. So we carried out um, a qualitative study with um, 32 undergraduate students looking at their experiences of pass fail grading. Um, we situated within a social constructivist and interpretivist paradigm. Um, and we, we, yeah, we really wanted to kind of find out what, what happened, um, what happened to, to students with this change to pass fail um, from graded. So we, we offered interviews. Um, we really wanted to be compassionate in how we designed this piece of research. So we decided to offer kind of different, different ways for, for students to, to engage with us. Um, our, our kind of main idea was to have a peer interview method. And that was kind of in response to Heron's friendship method of guided conversations. Um, where students, it was all online and students were invited to, to come um, and um, to meet with another student and they had some prompt questions and um, they, could, they could speak with each other. Um, I or one of the research team would be there to say hi and to introduce them to each other and to kind of, you know, make sure they're all good. And then once they're happy to go, we'd jump out and they'd carry on. It was recorded and they could finish off, um, you know, whenever they wanted to. Um, the idea was that it was to kind of give give them more space and to try and reduce some of the power dynamics that might be there with the researcher when they're talking about assessment and recognize that this is really can be quite um, uh, um, effective and quite difficult uh, subject to talk about sometimes. Um, sometimes students, one student didn't turn, didn't turn up, so there might be a, a, a participant by themselves. So we, we said to them, do you want to have a one-to-one -one, uh, with us? Some of them did want to have a one-to-one -one and that was fine. So there was always one of the team there um, to, to do that, if so. Um, and then we also offered um, interviews by email. Uh, we said that um, you know, students were welcome to, to write this or they could just record um, or they could add a video, whatever, um, however they wanted to do that. So um, we felt it was really important to, to be expansive in how we, we collected this, this data and the experiences for the students. Um, we applied uh, Brun Clark's uh, reflexive thematic analysis um, uh, as a kind of flexible analytical method. And we were quite deductive in our approach. Uh, we were really starting to think around this idea of harm and do no harm. And this was coming out a lot in, in our conversations and what we were looking at. So I'm just gonna go through the kind of, the sort of four, four kind of themes that we were exploring. Um, one was um, that grades add stress and anxiety. Um, I'll give you a moment just to, to read through this um, year one student's quote. Um, So grading was causing stress because my students 
we're showing an assessment of learning rather than seeing it as assessment for learning. Um, and they were really making comparisons uh, with other people um, and they were feeling incredibly deflated at not getting the grade that they wanted, even though some of them were, you know, um, all of us were going through the pandemic and still are, and uh, there was illness and caring factors, all sorts of different things going on. Um, but the very act of handing in work and not having a good sense of how good it was um, or how it would be perceived by students um, and tutors um, created a lot of anxiety and stress. Um, for many students, grading is just more stressful. One, um, one student referred to, to getting their grades as, as, as being like a heart attack. Um, we talked about the harm that was done by grades to students' sense of self-worth um, and, and, and how that could have impacts negatively on the sense of, of belonging um, and, and this kind of feelings of worthiness um, that, that can be really kind of uh, impacted by grading. Um, so one argument given by students for the need of grades is that their, their grades are the best indicator of their own worth, of their own level. Um, regardless of the feedback that they're receiving. Um, and this kind of supports those ideas of ranking, of hierarchies between students as well. Um, and one student said, you know, with normal grades, you can just tell your place. Um, and that was a first year student. So this, this kind of, these ideas are really kind of ingrained, um, you know, with, within, within the kind of experience of education. Um, they, this was the grading was a way that they made um, self judgments, um, and that that was the only way they they, they they felt they could do it or talk about their value as a human being in within the kind of educational setting. Um, so as such, the grades were kind of reinforcing or denying their sense of of self. Um, and one first year student had talked about how low achievement was a sign of being the worst person, um, and other students kind of confirmed this these views as well. Um, we said that grades damage peer and student um, to, to staff relationships. Um, you can read through this, this as well. Um, grades were associated with harming peer relationships because they promote isolation and separation. And they don't promote collaboration and interconnection. Um, and there was a real consensus among students that grades um, symbolize their status and, and talked previously about ideas of, of the symbolic value of grades and grading um, and then grades appear to be acting as a real kind of unhelpful proxy for belongingness um, so the winners are belonging and the losers are not belonging I know Jan explores this in her work as well um, you know if you get A's you're okay and I'm in a good position um, but when students don't receive that grade um, and sometimes even through the past fail then there's a frustration of not being able to ascertain their place um, or, or being standing out, that those ideas of wanting to stand out, that sort of dominated the conversation. Um, some students expressed real discontent that, um, that, they, that everyone received the same level of, of social status with pass fail. Um, some students were really angry and resentful of their perceived unfairness of not being recognized for, for aspects of their, um, their strengths or their comparative learning identity. Um, some considered themselves to be harder working, to, um, you know, to care more for their studies, um, to have more ambition. Um, so there's a real kind of displaying of having a need uh, to feel better than, than, their, than their peers. And we're talking about grades encouraging self-censorship as well. Um, and, and that again, Cohen, this is drawing on what Cohen said earlier as well, um, the grades lead to not being able to bring your whole self to learning. They can be a barrier to authenticity um, because graded assessment could lead to people wanting to, to please others and, and that kind of self-censorship as students are kind of adhering to what the, you know, those notions of what knowledge is valued um, and what is not uh, by both tutors and also by society. Um, so students are discussing how gradings influenced what they, what they did or they didn't do in, in, in their work based on what they think is gonna get them a good grade. Um, and they felt the, the need to assimilate to those kind of norms to play it safe. Um, and again, because grades are connected to self-worth and social status, you know, it's possible that the risks are just too great. Um, and you know, one, one student had talked about how grades were felt oppressive, um, that they'd limited their expression of self, um, self-identity. So 
building on this kind of idea of, of the whole self, um, I wanted to just share another clip with you again from the symposium. Um, and this is um, Janine Francois. So Janine was a co-course leader of um, uh, culture curation, uh, culture criticism and curation, CCC at Central St. Martins. Um, and she's talking in this uh, video clip that I'm going to show you about how um, she delivered a lecture um, on a festival um, and she had um, she'd then experienced um, the students um, in who'd listened to the lecture um, had then said that they had been their grandfather had been involved in in, in fest tech which is a, a, um, a festival in Nigeria in 1977 which is pretty massive but there wasn't a lot of documentation around it um, and the student had um, uh, there had loads of um, kind of uh, uh, objects and design pieces of design from it from the grandfather who had been like driving the all the all the kind of um, uh, creative work around this festival. Um, so Janine and the team had decided to to change what is a predominantly text based course, um, as you can imagine, culture criticism curation. It's very much written writing based to create kind of um, photo essay. So um, again, I'm just going to try. Um, Stop sharing here and going to jump on to another one a second. So Janine's kind of explained um, uh, the kind of the background to this around Festac and, um, and she's just going to talk to us a little bit about the kind of the whole the whole self. In their own time. So why? OK, it's a great thing a student produced this work in response to a lecture. I'm sure this isn't a kind of unusual story for my course, but it was very impactful for me because it really made me think about what exactly is our assessment practice on BA cultural criticism and curation? We talk about wanting to make um, students who are responsive to the world. We talk about developing curatorial practice, making cultural producers, making writers. And yet all of our assessment practices, when it came to critical thinking, criticality, focused on and prioritised the written word, and which for me was hugely problematic because effectively what we're saying is that the written word is the only way in which we can show and, and students demonstrate to us that they can be academically rigorous, which sounds very colonial and patriarchal and class-based. And as the course is going through a particular process of wanting to shift dominant ideologies and dominant frames of references, i.e. decolonizing the curriculum and readjusting and removing Eurocentricity out of how we think about knowledge production, surely it made sense to want to encourage our students to think about knowledge production in its own, only in its contemporary formats, but in other ways and other communities in which they belong to also produce knowledge. And for us, that was storytelling. So how do we encourage our students to think about their essays, not as just a site of, you know, referencing theorists or um, concepts, but as a form of producing a narrative in a way of communicating ideas visually through the written word to create a piece of affect. And um, on the team, we thought that the video essay could be a really useful site or a site of um, provocation to push and to encourage our students to, to think of that as a process. So it was kind of looking at essays work, that kind of been a eureka moment for me and my colleagues for us to think about how do we enact this. So we did this to stage one students, which might be potentially unfair, but we felt like, well, they don't know the curriculum, right? This to them will just be normal. This is what they think that they would have to do. So we created a brief where we broke it down into six areas. We asked them to do a bit of visual research, which then informs a video essay, engaging some prompts of how they could approach it. It could have been a podcast, it could be them talking to the camera, it could be um, something more experimental, and I'll show you an example. Um, we then wanted them to reflect on their practice, right? Like, how did it feel going through this process? How did it feel having to produce something? And what do you prefer? Do you like making video essays? Do you like writing essays? Do you prefer both? So we really felt that the doing and the reflected on the doing were really equal processes to the final outcome of their assessment. So now I'm just going to show you um, an example of one of our stage one students. It's just 
I like abstract work, perhaps. So it's probably a work that spoke to me when I was assessing the video. So I'm going to share, stop sharing my slides and then share another screen again. So again, just, just bear with me. This is all getting a bit meta with us all sharing screens and stopping and slide sharing. Um, yeah, so Janine's, um, Janine goes on to, to show another, um, another video essay from, with another student, um, which I would uh, again recommend um, if you've got time to, to, to watch. Um, the reason I, I wanted to show you that was to kind of think about, um, about this idea of whole self. You know, we've talked about past fail, I was thinking about these first year students um, um, who are the same first year students that Janine's talking about. Um, and thinking about how we can um, how we can kind of bring the, the whole self to um, to assessment practices. Let me just see if I'm doing that. Okay, but that's working. Um, so I know we haven't got lots of time left, but with this idea of the whole self, I just wanted to oh, um, show you this kind of this other part. So Janine is, is part of the, the sort of the, the research strand on, on looking at the whole self and, and her thinking has been really kind of um, part of, of how we've sort of developed this. So in this strand it's um, Professor Sam Broadhead, Laura da Costa, Dr. Laura da Costa at Leeds Arts University, myself, Liz Bunting and Janine Francois at UIL who have been looking at these ideas of um, of what what does it mean to bring your whole self to to assessment um, and we realized that we've been doing quite a lot of work around um, pedagogies and practices you know and, and that in some ways we were um, quite uh, confident around that and sharing examples but we were aware that we, we hadn't looked at the kind of the policies and we started to to talk about our different lenses um, obviously Janine there was talking about decolonizing um, and we were thinking about what does sort of decolonizing assessment look like um, what those kind of interactions with assessment with indigenous and non-Western knowledges and mindsets. Um, this idea of ethical assessment of kind of like do no harm as a kind of compassionate principle um, spun from the, the no detriment policy was, was really core. Um, and Liz and I have been developing more work around trauma-informed pedagogy, so thinking around kind of um, the neurological ways of thinking about how students, um, what, what they bring um, to, to, to kind of to learning, to assessment um, of what trauma and experiencing trauma um, um, kind of uh, does in that space. Um, so we're kind of, we're, we decided to, to talk to the assessment policies and to look at them and to, and to think about um, what is the relationship between assessment, the assessment policy and students whole self and how does a policy speak to that? Does it speak to it at all? Um, so we've we've only just sort of started on this, so I wanted to mention it, um, but we we haven't got um, we haven't kind of got that far into it. We started some document analysis, and we've been looking at um, using policy archaeology as a kind of um, as a methodological approach. Um, but um, as you can probably imagine, if you took time to look at your own institution's um, assessment policy or assessment regulation, when you start thinking about um, the positioning of the student. Um, and, and how they're kind of, it's sort of set up that the student will try to cheat or will try to fail or you know, will try to, um, to, to be doing things that they shouldn't be doing and this kind of procedural um, sense around a lot of the assessment regulations and policies is quite, it's quite startling. Um, so we wanted to do some work in this space um, and to also maybe connect the conversations between quality and academics, because um, there feels like a, a disconnect in, in many institutions. Um, so that's kind of our, our next step with, with, with kind of the whole self and what we're looking at there. Um, so I'm just, um, yeah, sort of aware, aware of time. And I think um, I'm, I'm gonna finish off there. So uh, another, another sort of suggestion was, um, Again, Jan, Jan and I have both contributed to this um, to this article that De Debbie McVitie has has produced in in Wonky, um, Wonky H -E, which um, is looking at different types of assessment and changes and assessment change um, further to the pandemic across the higher education sector. And there's some really interesting things in here. So if this is something that um, that that you're interested in, you might want to check out some um, some of uh, what other folk are doing across across the sector as well. Um, and I just wanted to kind of put this out here really as, um, and maybe in, you could pop it in the chat or tell us when we have a discussion, um, but there might be one thing that, that you are doing already or that you want to do or that you will do to kind of foster belonging and, and compassion in your practice. Um, 
that you may be teaching or you may be researching um but but it would be great to sort of share some of your thoughts around around that and maybe some of the things that people are already doing um and I, I really want to thank the the QAA our team um so this Sam and Laura and Peter and Nina Liz Emily Neil Janine Alan, Vicky, Robert, Marianne and Thea, they're all amazing. And also kind of um, extra big thanks to, to Jan for her support and uh, Dr. Mahabali and also to Kate Murray at QAA for supporting all of this too. Um, and I've got lots of references, probably not all of them. So if I've forgotten anything, please, um, please let me know. So thank you. Uh, well, thank you, thank you so much, Vicky. That that was that was absolutely fabulous. It was it was inspiring, but practical at the same time, and gave lots of insights. And and yeah, the chat has been very much about how this space creates somewhere we can think about this. Um, we'll, we'll send you the all the chat afterwards. You might not be able to see it all, um, but I just like to invite questions. Uh, either in the chat or in person. It would be lovely to hear from you. You may not have a question, you may just be able to answer um, Vicky's sort of gentle challenge. What's one compassionate thing we could all do in our practice? everyone's having a having a bit of a think you know one of the things I think Vicky and I know we've talked about this before is just bringing this word into play um, and and sort of having each other's backs in meetings that one of the ways is you know it's not just changing our practices but changing the culture to make it more receptive to these practices and I think people do find it difficult in a meeting to discuss um, excuse me, that's my phone. It's a day, but people find it, if people find that it, they'd look odd if they just said, what about compassionate assessment? I was at a big thing in my university and I talked about we'd lost the joy and someone sort of nervously giggled, well, how could you have joy in assessment? And I'm thinking, well, how could you not? This is what students have achieved. So what do you think about that? One of the things we have to do is this, being, you know, seeing that we have solidarity with other people to start bringing these things into open conversation. Yeah, thanks, Jan. I think I think um, the 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 kind of the pandemic and, and has, has shifted um, conversations because there has been much more of a focus on um, on kind of well being and those experiences. Um, and I, you know, because as Rumi says, you know, the crack that lets the light in, and that kind of um, that space for us to kind of say that you know we can we can recognise this as, as something that's really important for staff and for students. Um, I think it's it's really interesting that one of the institutions involved in our project, and um, that was exactly what what somebody said um, about um, about their discipline. They said if I brought up the word compassion, it's a very male dominated discipline. Um, yeah, he won't mind me saying it's architecture um and um and said if i if i talk about it there they'll just be like their eyes will be rolling around in the back of their heads um and i i thought actually that's also something which i'm going to recognize uh, at ual a few years ago i think we were also there but it feels like things have moved and i don't know if that's because there is a kind of catalyst of more and more people doing this kind of work um so you're not on your own um, I think sometimes being the only person in an institution is, is difficult. Um, I wonder whether um, sometimes in the creative arts, some of the subjects might be a bit more open to it. I don't know, I'm making a bit of a generalization there, um, but that kind of sense of um, thinking about embodiedness and feeling and affect, these are kind of the things which I think we, you know, we, we, we can talk about, we talk about a, a lot. Um, I mean, they're, they're kind of going in and, and being in kind of quality meetings and talking about love, you know, I, mean, I quite like this because, <laughs> because it's because you do get these really interesting kind of responses, but um, I think it is about trying to connect with other people who are kind of recognizing that um, to, to, to kind of um, to open up those conversations. Um, there may be other ways in that are better, it might be that compassion isn't the right word and um, 
trauma-informed pedagogy is, you know, trauma-informed practices is one of the things that we've been talking about a lot. Um, interestingly, at Glasgow School of Art, which some of you will know, um, burned down twice in the fire. They've gone through two really terrible fires. Um, and then the pandemic. So not just students, but staff have been traumatized by going through this. So maybe for them thinking compassion might not be the, the, the term that they would want to use, but maybe sort of trauma-informed policies and practices would relate better to, to those people in that context. Thank you. We've got a question in the chat and then um, uh, Lisa here. And, and I think people, if you feel comfortable now, you can, you can show yourselves. Um, that would be nice. So actually we'll go to Lisa first because she's here and then we'll come back to the chat. Hi, thank you very much. Um, Vicky, that was great. I thought it was such an interesting talk. Thank you for that. Um, I thought one of my questions, with I'm really interested in the, the concept of the pass and fail that you were, you were talking about. Um, I'm a lecturer in design at um, Lancaster Uni and I do a lot of work with our first year students and we've been talking quite a, quite a bit recently about what we we perceive to be a, a we want to be able to encourage them to be uh, more creatively risk taking but the what what we feel is that the the grades are, are quite a a barrier to doing this that that some of our students are so preoccupied by you know what do I need to do to get an A grade type of thing and we kind of think if we could change that and that the, the kind of the past grade is a seems seems a nice kind of way into that but I, I wonder have you have you one of my fears with that is um do you find that students may just sit back a bit too much with that you know that if if they're not pushing for that higher kind of grade do or do you find that it's it, it works out okay I think it was really, yes, yeah, really interesting point because um, I guess it's it's coming coming to it with an expectation that our students will just coast, and 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 that in itself, that kind of assumption, um, I, I I think it's, it's it's interesting to sit with that for a while um, and think about why are students coming to university? Mm -hmm. um, do they all want to coast? Um, you know, there's that in itself. Maybe we want to think about a little bit too. Um, I do recognise you. Know, you know, students, especially if they're coming from UK education, they will have gone through a system where grades, you know, you know where you are, you've got your level, you know, it, it's drummed in. Uh, so it's really, really hard to kind of remove yourself from that. Um, and I think um, at UL, we've done some work um, when we had the new assessment criteria put in a few years ago, of moving the first unit to pass fail only. So we'd, we'd already kind of done a little bit of groundwork with that. So when the whole year went, there was there, there, there was something there already in kind of an acknowledgement that that first project, you know, if it's pass fail, it takes away that stress mm. um, and it gives students, you know, the time to, to kind of just um, to kind of be. Um, one of the students I interviewed um, was talking about how um, she came from from, a, from another country. She wasn't UK based and she was saying, I don't even know how to work the washing machine you know let alone get a get an a or a b she's like i'm you know i'm, I'm still trying to find out where to buy my foods you know so just this is amazing it gives me space and time to be able to do yeah. learn what i need to do um and actually in our in the symposium amina talks about that it, you know she says it you know it gave me time to learn to to be able to, to know what i needed to do before i had to figure out how well to do it and I thought yeah. well, that's, that's really helpful. Understand the process. It's where the library is. All of that. The, that's the kind of important stuff. Um, so I think I think there you know there's there's things in there. But it but it's interesting about the assumptions that students and staff have around yeah. what grading is and what yeah. it does. Um, yeah, I you agree. Know. You you actually you you made me me reflect a little bit on some of my own shortcomings in some ways because I kind of you know as a a lecture, I, I will find myself saying to students, oh, I bet you were really happy with your grade and in that positive kind of way, but at the same time. Um, and just last week I had a student approach me who'd, um, she got a grade A at first, uh, a really great piece of work. And um, she approached me because she was feeling very underwhelmed and disappointed by the grade. And my immediate response was, goodness, did, 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 if I mixed up the, you know, <laughs> she got the wrong grade. And I said, I said, I think you, you got a grade A, didn't you? She went, yes, but I've seen some of the other students work who got a grade A and I don't think they should have got a grade. And it was really, I, I was like, wow, that's, it's, it's quite, it just dominates, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, 
again, you know, those those ideas of kind of collaboration. Um, you know, this, this isn't it's not just education. It's, you know, we we know that it's kind of Sort of neoliberal education and, and and kind of wider but those those ideas of always having to be competitive and to be the best yeah um you know to always everyone has to get an a you know it's like how, <laughs> you know that that that's just it just becomes really kind of problematic yeah. um but a lot of the students that we talked to were, were saying about how um you know by the past failed then enabled that kind of um collaboration but i, th I wonder how much um what we didn't do was talk about we, we did ask about a little bit about what was kind of the pre-work done by by the teaching staff around moving to pass fail and it was really different across the institution and that's part of the work I did on looking at the staff experiences because it was a switch in in a pandemic and the staff weren't really supported at all um I mean they had a couple of workshops with me which really isn't an awful lot out of thousands of staff you know um and only a few people came so um you know they had they had other you know support within the colleges but there, there wasn't a lot and those curriculums weren't designed for pass fail so you know this is a particular context of of pass fail um grading for mm -hmm. courses that weren't really designed for it um but we we were wondering whether it would be um more beneficial for the university to um, to offer um, kind of optional pass fail, so that it's only staff who are committed to it that are going to do it with their students um, who see the benefit in it. Because if you try and kind of get everybody to do something, um, and if there's reticent or secret grading or all sorts of interesting strange practices that go on, um, that could be that could become even more harmful for for students. Um, so this idea of kind of can you move to pass fail? Could you support different courses to have different grading? Um, I'm kind of interested in, in whether what that would maybe look like as well. Brilliant, thank you very much. Thanks, there's, um, there's a couple of questions in the, in the chat which I think build on this very nicely and um, if no one, I'll come back in again later too. So one, um, Sarah is asking that, um, you, you talked positively about, about the awarding gap but is there a danger, though, that pass fail could 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 mask or hide um, problems there as much as it helps? And I think a related question comes from Nell about how do we help students with the motivation, the sense of improvement over time, if the marking is always pass fail? Yeah, they're both really really important points in, in this work. I think. Um, I mean, ethnicity awarding differentials is really, really interesting because, again, this is just, you know, as Neil said, this is just one, there's, there's not enough here necessarily to say um, so what, what's in there, but the idea of, of masking in itself is, is interesting because a lot of our courses, the, um, uh, the amount of students that we have um, who are maybe black or um, from global majority backgrounds are, um, might be too small, you know, so if you've only got three students, um, it might not be in the data in a way, and you might, might not be able to disaggregate that. There's, there's all, there's all these kind of issues with the data as well. Um, I think it's perhaps about um, having other ways and other channels for students to be able to, uh, to report on racism or, um, or have to put kind of complaints in. Or, or for, I'm not sure that the, um, whether the NSS that that's good enough. You know, there, there needs to be other ways that students are supported um, in that. Um, so that uh, you know, students of color have, um, are, are you know, have have other support to. Um, so it's not just on your final grade. So I think that's that's kind of quite quite a key part of it. And um, I'm not sure in terms of um, you know the, the kind of ethnicity awarding differentials in terms of like grading whether that's whether it is around bias. Um, you know, in, in kind of staff's grading practices of students. Um, I'd really like to do more work around this. And I think this is what Neil and I have been talking about as well, is like, how do we find out a bit more about what pass fail means in this context? Um, but the idea of hiding something and masking is, it, I'd say is a massive concern because you, you know, it's that kind of sweeping inequality under the carpet is obviously not what, what you want from this. Um, but it's more finding out maybe what, what's the mechanism here that, that, that's making a difference and can we build on that? Um, I don't know if that kind of answers that a wee bit. Yeah, and I was just wondering if I could come in whether we could have some combination here of having pass fail as what the assessor does, but could we combine it with ipsative assessment as um, championed by Gwyneth Hughes 
and there's a couple of books on this where students are themselves marking their own pro you know not marking um uh, yeah sort of um mm, mm, <laughs> i've lost the word but 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 showing to themselves that they've made progress that they are judging themselves by their previous work and saying yes i'm still doing this adequately to pass but i can see now i'm doing it with more complexity i'm doing it this so the formal pass fail the, the high stakes is there and then we could have an ipsative thing which is almost like a learning journal i suppose or something an assessment journal for students where they use gwyneth's ideas of the idea of personal best self-improvement i'm just throwing that out there i don't know is that a mad idea no, it's really i mean it's within art and design practice it's really interesting because you know with the kind of sketchbooks and journals and that um that kind of reflection on your on your practice and what you're doing is um it's quite embedded within subjects um yeah i really i really like how that sort of ties to those ideas around assessment literacies um and i'm kind of I'm, I'm always i'm just yeah we've been just having these conversations around you know students are always looking at the grades as the marker um how can you ever really develop um kind of that sort of assessment literacy and feedback literacy or feed forward literacy um and there's something there around you know can if you took grading away completely you know um i'm just throwing that out there too then 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 would would that then necessitate you know feedback um i mean there's lots of courses as we know that are pass fail when i did my pg pgce which was pass fail um interestingly the course leaders that i've done work with who have gone through maybe masters or you know different kind of postgraduate courses that have been pass fail um and quite kind of vocational have been real advocates of it and they've talked about the transition from grading to pass fail which can be really sticky and difficult um i was definitely one of those students it was like you know i got i got a first class degree for fine arts when i did my pgce and wasn't graded i was like oh i don't know how to think about this because it's just really weird i've always kind of been you know i've always gotten quite good grades and that I've, I'm, I'm somebody who probably wants that external recognition kind of been brought up a bit like that as in my personality maybe to be like that um so there was a transition for for me to go in obviously at the time i didn't necessarily have the language or understand how i do now um but i think that you know if you're taken through that and explained and it's there and it's supported you know you can go on that journey what didn't happen for our students in our research was was any of that really because it was the, it was a pandemic and it was a boom policy change here we go so that kind of work that you would do and planning and explaining and, and kind of co-constructing knowledges around assessment that ideally you know would go on didn't really happen in this context or happened in patchy areas um so i think if that was going to happen you know if you were going to move to a pass fail model you'd have to think about all that kind of pre-work beforehand perhaps even if before the students come to the institution, you know, so they can, they'll be aware of it, you know, it's their choice, do they, do they want this or not, you know? Thanks. So we've got a question now from Kay. Yeah, thanks, thanks ever so much. Sorry, I couldn't find where to put my hand up. So I was going to start waving at you, Jan. Um, thanks, Vicky, it's absolutely fabulous. I kind of, can I move the conversation on a little bit more? I mean, I can hear this a lot around grading and ungrading and, this sort of fixation on marks um, is, is deeply troubling. Um, but the other issue that I always get pushed back on, so I'm absolutely sold on what you're doing, um, but the other issue I'm, I get pushed back on is around, I thought it was really powerful in your presentation when um, people were talking about alternative voices, alternative kind of ways of expressing knowledge production and all that kind of thing. Um, and I'm, I think that's a really key way into all of this as well. How do you alternatively express? Um, so it's not always just about writing. Um, I'm really sold on that. But the pushback I often get is, and quite often from writing developers or learning developers, saying you can diversify too much. And if you give students choice to express themselves in, a, in an alternative way, then they're not going to learn to be able to do the writing that they need to do on all the other modules. Um, and I guess a lot of what we're talking about here is how to um, combat is a rather combative word, but challenge these taken for granted that are absolutely endemic in our systems. Um, 
because the people who make the rules have usually done very well by the rules or the people that are privileged by the rules tend to want to be very conservative about them. So I'm always really keen to hear what are the kinds of ways we can push back on the resistances that we often get. And one, one which really surprises me is don't give students choice because we've got to train them into writing practices. Um, and it seems to me, I, I just got to find another better way of expressing that this is not the way to go. I'm sorry, that's a bit of a rant, but I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. And that's like exactly the reason why, you know, Janine and Mo Ling and we've got, you know, other practitioners, of course, at, at UAL, being able to, to do case studies and let them speak about, um, I think you know Janine. That obviously, I just that's a, just a little a little clip there. But you know, it's so personal. You know her, um, you know her discipline. You know, designing the course, it's going through revalidation, and then being able to um, you know sort of talk about how that you know the light bulb moment of of what then happened and the absolute joy of you know what the students were able to do in terms of really producing you know I mean, industry quality work. You know, it, but it was it wasn't just text based. So there's something around the kind of case studies as well and being able to kind of share share those, I think. I mean, there's so many things on those kind of tropes that we hear and, um, you know, in some of our disciplines that are very industry focused, you know, that kind of, um, you know, we, we need to get them ready for industry and, um, you know, it's going to be tough, we're going to toughen them up. And that idea of kind of creating really quite hideous, actually, um, assessment um, moments for students because the industry is like that. Um, so I guess it's, it's trying to, in whatever way works in your context, those disruptions and maybe asking staff to stay with that thought for a while. Um, the more we've been doing this work in compassion, the more I've kind of recognised that I'm, um, you know, always kind of producing and making and doing. And the idea of slowness has become um, really, really important to stop um, and just sit with things and think about it and really, really kind of um, create space for for, um, for for staff to to do that. So the work that Liz and I are doing is, has been, yeah, about kind of just creating that space to, to, to talk and to think about some of these things. And what does that mean? What does it mean for the students? What does it mean for, for you as a, as a lecturer who's creating that condition and then you're know, doing that? Obviously our ALs maybe don't have any um, agency in this really. Um, so there's all different kind of things in there, but I think kind of case studies and sharing, sharing that um, kind of the personal stuff, but also the outcomes, you know, that there aren't resubmissions, that, that you know, there's really great grades, you know, coming from it, if that's the thing that's going to push the boat. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a multi-pronged way, I think, maybe of, of opening up that. Thanks. Thanks. This is, this is so interesting. So now we have Pi J4. I'm sorry. Um, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, sorry, I should find a way of explaining that I'm called Jane Pye, but I don't know how to change um, how it comes up on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, um, so just to say thank you, everyone. Um, this is absolutely um, fascinating and inspiring. And I was just really um, struck by uh, Kay's comment around this, um, I suppose, this kind of a process we get pushed into around somehow uh, somehow believing that the whole uh, ability to write is what is is the kind of predominant um, way we should be assessing students. And I was just so struck by it. My colleague and I have been having this conversation and about how um, actually, whilst I'm cautious of saying this in relation to how thinking about how skills for employment can lead into a kind of a training and employment agenda around the role of higher education, it really strikes me that actually if we want students to be able to leave university and be sort of confident and um, able to be good citizens, whatever that, that looks like, that, that actually writing is only one of the skills that we want to help them develop and actually kind of talking and communicating and working collaboratively surely have got to be something that we should be supporting people to value and think um, as, as being as important as being able to write and reference perfectly and, and all of that. And it, it really occurred to me recently that um, 
I mean, people may may know about this. I'm about to um, have uh, go through the the uh, process of being assessed myself through a talking process dialogic assessment. So, if it's okay for me, a member of staff in a university, why is that not something that we can support our students to do? I'm, I'm saying that knowing many of them might find that really, really stressful in different ways, but it just feels like there's so many opportunities that we don't explore enough um, for our students. And I guess I've just been really struck by, by that today. So thank you. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, I was thinking that even with the, um, the fellowship applications and we use the sort of the dialogue for um, the senior fellow and, and for fellow to be able to talk <laughs> because yeah, sometimes it's just a bit too much to have to write it all down. Yeah. Thanks, that's, yeah, gosh, so much going on here. So we have um, Juso, uh, please forgive me if I've said it wrongly, coming all the way from Hong Kong, very late at night. You actually pronounced my name with a very nice Finnish accent, so <laughs> no need to apologize. Um, thank you, Vicky, that, was, that has been fascinating. I've made a lot of notes. I feel like I have a lot of ideas. I feel quite inspired, even though it is it is a late night here. Um, I have a... I have a question, and, and I, at first I thought it was a bit of an academic question after a uh, quite a practical discussion, I think. But then actually I started to think, no, it's actually also a very deep personal and, and practical issue for me at the moment. So my uh, question or reflection concerns the idea of individualism in assessment, because when I entered this session about belonging compassion in assessment, I, I, I really carried the understanding that these concepts are profoundly substantially social they can't just be uh, averaging to individual students they're often well they have to be something that happens in the social world of ours um, and when it comes to assessment I, I I feel very inspired about hearing the hearing this kind of creating that probably disrupts those performative individualistic culture of higher education that you're only doing this for yourself and for your own certification and uh, and, and grades so I would like to hear what, if you think, uh, what you think about uh, this kind of un uncreating or pass fail creating to is it a is it enough to disrupt that kind of individualism that is so deeply connected to what we think assessment and creating are in higher education and, and beyond and the, and when I said that this is a personal issue as well is that um, I've been my background in, in mathematics so I'm, I'm quite used to teaching very large numbers of students students with um hundreds of uh, hundreds of students in the same class and now when i'm finally teaching at the faculty of education i have only like 15 students i feel like doing pass fail creating is a very different kind of a different kind of an issue it, it, it's very natural it just happens we just, we just go to the classroom and talk i mean now we're doing it on, on zoom but anyway but even then actually the students carry a lot of Wait, I think that's the word that I use in the chat as well about the individualistic nature of assessment. Even though there's only a only a small number of us, even though it's pass fail, and even though we're able to have those learning uh, communal learning moments when we're learning together, assessment, even that pass fail assessment, is still something the students see is very deeply connected to their work, their individual performance. So, sorry, it's been a long rambling reflection. I would, I would love to hear what what is your thoughts about this yeah thank you uh, yeah no it's really it's really interesting i think it's come out in um in lo lots of different ways around um yeah how how assessment is designed how it's kind of carried out how it's um you know the kind of collaborative aspects of it and how the work is produced and shared and and all of those things i mean i was thinking i did actually was thinking about jan's work on a uh, particular around sort of honest and the idea of the sort of the relational between you know the kind of love respect esteem um and how that might fit into this as well about um ways that kind of assessment is um, i was just thinking about kind of um you know how quite in, in arts and design you know quite often we'll kind of show work and we'll exhibit it and we'll be, so students might make something but then it will be a kind of it'll be a um they might make it individually but then it'll be something that they build together a show or you know a film or something else so there, there's this kind of ideas of how we can kind of work collaboratively with it I don't know if I'm kind of speaking to the kind of theoretical side of it, and I don't know if Jan, if you, if you wanted to speak to some of that as well, because I think your work's really clear with that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I suppose what I would say is that um, I, for, for people who sort of think this theoretical stuff is really hard, 
I don't think it has to be. And I do think what we want to do is, is not be afraid to take bold ideas down to the classroom and down to the everyday parts of assessment. And I suppose that's what I'm, I'm trying to do to do with it. And, and I think it relates, the, the honest, my, the way I've used that, relates to your idea of the student as the whole person. And I think that's really, really important. And I think that's something that we, we, we say often in universities, but we don't think through the implications of what that means for entrenched and taken for granted policies and procedures and things like that. But that makes it sound like change is overwhelming. But actually, I do think small, you know, we, we, we make the change where we can and, and as well as having a larger vision. Yeah, thanks, Jan. Yeah, that, those ideas around, um, yeah, kind of recognition, I think, are, are really, really interesting in terms of building the relational and um, the aspects of, of assessment there. Um, I think that reminder, I've been reading a lot of um, Rosie Bray-Dotty at the minute and just thinking about kind of, yeah, you can just, just doing a little bit, <laughs> we might not be able to change all of it, but just doing a little bit um, is, is maybe a way of kind of trying to nourish ourselves in, in some of this as well. Yeah, yeah well, I, I think um, we, uh, we might be able to, to close now. Um, just on that, on that thought of doing a little bit, I did want to reach out to FAS colleagues or Lancaster colleagues that I am looking for departments that or a module here that wants to try out some of these ideas about socially just assessment, inclusion, compassion, belonging, uh, different ways of recognising achievement, particularly other than the fairly empty signifier of a 60% or whatever. So do please get in touch. Uh, but then on the next note, it's my job as chair, well, to firstly thank everyone, particularly to thank Vicky, um, if we could give her a round of applause, because I think her work is absolutely um, amazing and is, is, has given voice to us all that we can talk about these things. And let's, let's be brave and continue to talk about them. <laughs> Uh, special thanks to Dee, Rebecca and Kumi who organise uh, these seminars and we're really um, grateful for their doing that. I also have to tell you about the next EDRES Super Seminar, which is on Wednesday the 9th of March at this time. And it will actually be my colleague, Dr. Kayleigh Rosewell and myself, um, chaired by Paul Ashwin, talking about um, student sense of self and belonging in society, um, including assessment and how that nourishes it or doesn't in our current practices. We'll be drawing on a two longitudinal studies and comparative studies where we're going to eventually have eight years of data of students in and outside university uh, following undergraduates it's looking at chemistry and chemical engineering and you might think, oh, well, that's not my disciplines. But that's the whole point, looking at how we can achieve this sense of compassion and uh, social justice in what may seem unlikely disciplines. So please join us for that or join us for any other EDRES seminars in the future. You're all very welcome. And thank you for your participation today. And a final big round of applause, please, for Vicky. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Lovely to see you all.